Good morning, Harvest. How are you? You know, it struck me that um, it might kind of seem like the cafe is trying to give you subliminal messaging. Did you look at the cross? Like, are we trying to make you hungry? It's so funny because, of course, when I saw the cross, which, by the way, our media team, amazing that they created this. Um, but I'm like, oh, yeah, the dry desert. That makes sense. Someone after the 930 service came up and said, looks just like a brownie to me. <laughs> and you know what? Now I can't see anything but a brownie. So you're welcome. You either see a brownie and now you're hungry or whatever. So how hungry are you? Are you kind of a little hungry? Look, I, I just love when we get to come to worship. I mean, there's something really powerful that happens when the family of faith comes together, just lifting up their voices, praising God, declaring who God is. But there's nothing that says we can't have a little fun while we're doing it, right? So I thought this is the perfect day to have a little fun in worship in the sermon. So we're going to have a little game show moment. I know, you're excited. So now I need a volunteer from the audience. Yeah, Frank, you were left by yourself. Come on, come on, Frank. Let's give Frank a big hand. Grab, a, grab your microphone. Grab the microphone. Come on up here. So all right. So, Frank, I have a little something that I brought with me today. Okay. All right. Um, now, I want to know, before we get to this, um, just to sort of say, uh, are, you, are you hungry? Does that brownie sound really good to you right now? The brownie sounds great, but I, I have had breakfast already. You had breakfast? Okay. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, how hungry are you? Uh, two. Two. Okay. Awesome. So, um... So, since you're not too hungry, um, my first question is, would you be willing to eat whatever I have under here, not knowing, because um, H-E-B did have a sale on pickled pig's feet, I'm just saying. Uh, could be dried kale, could, I mean, there's a lot of things. So, how likely would you be... I, I am lactose intolerant. And, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gluten free. Yeah, I'm, yeah I there mean, you I, go. So I'm, not so much. I, I don't know. I'm not so sure. Okay, all right. So, well, well let, me, let me up the ante a little bit. All right, what if you went home today and you fasted for seven days? You did not eat anything at all from this point until we come back next week. And if I brought you up here after seven days of fasting, would you maybe be a little more willing to eat whatever is under here? Honestly, seven minutes of fasting is about my limit. <laughs> you are my kind of seven person. Days. Yes, I'm, I'm in, seven All right. days. All right, so you would agree with me that the, the more hungry you are, the more willing you would be to eat this. Absolutely, yes. All right, well, I'm not going to make you fast for seven days, but I will let you have what's under here, and it's not pickled pig's feet. Here we go. It is. You can, you can hold ooh, it. Ooh, 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 I love those. Go can ahead. I have it for real? You can. Okay. This is for you. <laughs> Show everyone what you got. Snickers, double. Snickers. All right. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Thank you, Frank. Now, aren't you glad that you came to church? You're like, what? She's giving out candy. This is so good. All right. So, so um, in 2010, Snickers launched a campaign that said, you're not you when you're hungry. Do you remember those commercials, right? When it's like, you're hangry, right? <laughs> However, I actually would argue against that. I would say, when you are hungry, I think you are actually more yourself. I think when you start stripping away all those comforts that you have, those things that make you feel good and in control and everything, when that starts getting stripped away in your life, 
I think that's when we see our true colors. Would you agree? Yes. So what today, we're going we're gonna to look at a, a scripture passage, but what I believe that we're going to see is that your desperation drives your decision making. Think about that for a minute. Your desperation drives your decision making. Now we all hope that when things go bad, when we are at, you know, the lowest point, we always hope to be our best, but the reality is this is usually when we fail. I mean, you know, if you're part of a family, when you're, if you're tired, things aren't going well, um, life is not going well, that is probably the time in your life you are more likely to maybe say something, something might come out of your mouth that later you have to go apologize for or whatever. We're really not always always at our best. But what if God wanted to show us a different way? What if God would say, instead of being hangry, I want to show you how to be holy, even in those moments? So we are in a series, it's called Jesus in the Wild, and we are looking at that passage, that story where Jesus went into the wilderness before he started his earthly ministry. And while Jesus was there, he was brought to a point of desperation. But even in that testing, he did not break he didn't show us the hangry version of himself. He didn't show us a lesser version of himself. He actually showed us what we can do when we find ourselves in a similar situation. And we get to see where he found his strength. So if you have your scriptures, uh, your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Luke 4. Um, if you've been here with us the last couple of weeks, um, Dan Wilt started us off and he actually read the entire passage of Jesus in the wilderness and saw that. And then last week, Mark went back to the beginning and he looked at just that first verse, really, of looking at Jesus going into the wilderness and he talked about that. But there was something that Mark said last week that is very important for us today. He told us how long Jesus was in the wilderness. Do you remember how many days Jesus was in the wilderness? 40 days, exactly. Now, here's why this is important. Because when you read or heard 40 days, there was context that was so critical that you were supposed to already know, but the context wasn't told to you. In fact, the reader or the hearer of this passage should have, as soon as you saw the words 40 days, your brain should have gone, oh! I know exactly what this passage is going to be referring to. Because what we have to know is the context, the lens to look through, which is we are supposed to think back to when the Israelites were in the desert for 40 days. We have to know this context. That's the lens that we have to look through in order to understand the lesson that we're supposed to get out of this passage in Luke. And so just so that we are all remember um, what the context is, is the Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt. They were freed from Egypt. They were led into the wilderness and they were asked to be obedient while they were there. And so here's the thing. They, all they had to do, all they had to do was be obedient and trust God. But as they entered into the desert, they actually became desperate. Why? Because they were in unfamiliar territory. Has anyone been in their life where they entered into a season that was unfamiliar? Right? And they didn't have a GPS or a map. Oh, gosh, the only thing they had was the presence of God in uh, the cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. And so God was saying, look, just obedient, be obedient to me and trust this presence that I've given you and just, just follow. But that was uncomfortable because they were in unfamiliar territory. 
The other reason why they got desperate is because they um, didn't have the comfort items, the food that they were used to. They couldn't just go to the marketplace and pick up, you know, what they needed. They couldn't even build, uh, like, uh, grow. They couldn't even do a garden because they were wandering. Um, And so they had to trust in God's provision. And so their desperation drove their decision making. And unfortunately, the decisions that they made was not to go, thank you, Lord, for the presence that you have given us. Thank you. No, no, no. They complained. They blamed their leader. They blamed God for what their circumstances were. And instead of being obedient, their desperation drove them to disobedience. And that disobedience meant that their um, path to the promised land, which should have taken two weeks, stretched to 40 years. Now that is the story that needs to be in our minds as we enter into reading about the wilderness story this time with Jesus. So let's go back and I want to read Luke chapter 4, just the first four verses. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Where for how many days? Forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. So for 40 days, he was tempted. He ate nothing. And one of the passages or one of the translations that I read, which I really liked, said, not just hungry, but used the word famished. He was Famished, and I think that that's a really good translation. But did you notice what it didn't say? It didn't say that the devil withheld the food, and it didn't say there was no food in the wilderness. Because the truth is, we do know people who lived in the wilderness and who did eat, like John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness. He ate locusts and honey, not a Snickers bar, right? But it was enough, right? So we're not told there was no food, but we are told that Jesus ate no food. He chose He self-imposed these restrictions on himself. And what I really love is that this reminds me of what we read in Philippians 2, this this centering of who Jesus is and this motivation. So in Philippians 2, we read, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why? Jesus, why? Why would you do this? Why would you actually make yourself physically, emotionally, spiritually vulnerable? Maybe it's because Jesus wanted to make sure, since he knew the readers and the hearers of this story would have known this context, maybe he wanted to make sure that we could compare the Israelites, um, what they did in their desperation and their decision making with what Jesus experienced and his decision making. Maybe he did it because he knew that one day you would be there too. That you would be in the desert, that you would find yourself desperate at some point in your life and he wanted to teach you what you can do when you are there. Maybe also is because he needed people to trust him. He was about to begin his ministry on earth with this message and his message was that God is fulfilling his covenant promise, that God is sending 
his son to reverse the curse in the garden. And you need to trust who God is. You need to believe that God is faithful. You need to believe that God is good. You need to believe that God will do what he said he was going to do. Maybe God said, I am going to choose to step into your shoes so you can trust me. Think about it. If something has ever happened in your life that was, that was bad, um, you probably had people come around you and go, I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm so sorry that you're in a job you don't like. I'm so sorry. You know, whatever it is. And, and they can say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. But when someone who has already been in your situation comes up to you and says, I'm so sorry, I completely understand what you're feeling. It's going to be okay. Let me tell you um, how I got through it. Like that person, you can trust that person probably more. That person has more credibility than someone who hasn't walked in your shoes, right? So maybe that's what, why Jesus chose to put himself in that situation in the wilderness. So Jesus was tempted. Throughout the 40 days, he was tempted. He went from, gosh, I'm okay, I had a breakfast taco, to, well, getting a little hungry, to uncomfortable, to painful, famished. But what we see is that Jesus was famished, but he was faithful. He was faithful. He did not act like the Israelites. He did not back away from the, from the situation that he was in. He did not blame God for the circumstances. Because what he knew, he knew what the enemy was trying to do. This is what the enemy loves to do. In situations like this, the enemy likes to drive a wedge in our relationship with God. And so the enemy was wiggling his way in there and go, oh, I'm going to get between you and your father. Don't you know that's what the enemy does to you too? Man, if stuff starts going wrong, if things start getting stripped away from you, if you start to become, you know, like uncomfortable and unfamiliar territory, oh, the enemy's like, yes, I love this. I am going to put in doubt. I'm going to drive a wedge between this person and God, and it's going to be great. But Jesus said, uh-uh, not today, Satan. Not today. You are not going to do this. Jesus' desperation drove him to God's word. Jesus' desperation drove him to use God's word as a weapon. And that's the lesson for us. That when things start getting stripped away, when we start getting hungry and things are painful, instead of complaining and blaming God, what we need to do is lean into God's word and say, no, 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 Satan, you are not going to do this. You're not. You see, hunger wasn't Jesus' problem, but it was his opportunity. Hunger wasn't the problem, but it became the opportunity for Jesus to stand on God's promises and say, nope, you are not going to do that today, Satan. And maybe our hunger, when we find ourselves in circumstances that we would like to not be in, when our comfort gets taken away, when things get stripped out of our life that we don't really like, maybe in, that's not our problem. But maybe it's an opportunity for us to lean into God's word like Jesus did. So what was his response? Well, he said, well... Man doesn't live on bread alone. But what I love about this, and this is why you have to know the context when you study it, is because he wasn't just saying something that sounded good on a bumper sticker. He was pointing back to the scripture that was given to the Israelites in the wilderness. He was pointing back, and anyone who read or heard this would also know that. So what he was quoting was Deuteronomy 8.3, 
that says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. Why was that response so important? It was because Jesus made a choice. You know he didn't have to stay in the wilderness. He was not chained to anything. He could have at any point said, you know what? Peace out. I am gone. This is too hard. I'm done. Ring the bell. Whatever. I don't want to do this anymore. But he made a choice. And he did it when the stakes were low, when he didn't have to be in it to prove to us that he would make the same choice when the stakes were really high. And the same choice was for our sake. I'm willing to suffer now when the stakes are low because guess what? Later on in my ministry, I'm going to be asked to suffer again for you. And I want you to know I made the choice now and I'm going to make the choice Later, look at Matthew um, 27. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand, knelt before him, mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him, took the reed, it struck him on the head. And after mocking him, they stripped him of the robe, put his own clothes on him, and then they led him away to crucify him. Jesus' desperation drove him to a decision to deny himself, to suffer for us. He did it in the desert, and he's going to do it again on the cross. Lent is a time where if you've grown up in the church, you may, ha- may hear people talk about giving something up for Lent. Right? So in the Christian calendar, we use Lent as an opportunity not only to go, thank you, Jesus. Like, we remember the suffering that, that you went through for us. But Lent also becomes this opportunity for us to sort of put ourselves to choose to go into the wilderness and say, go ahead and test me. Go ahead, Satan, try your best because I'm not going to give in. I am going to test the foundation of my faith. It's a lot like... um, Think of a, a house inspector, right? So if you have a house, um, an inspector is going to come, going to check the foundation, going to test the function of the house, kind of put it to, to the test to make sure that when the storms come, that the house will stand. I mean, you can wait until there's a hurricane and just, you know, hope, or you can test it. You can put it under some stress, you can make sure that it's going to stand up when the storms come. And for us, that's what Lent is. It gives us a chance to kind of allow ourselves to be put under stress because under stress, we discover yourself, right? Under stress, you discover yourself. You don't actually know how strong you are until the storms come. Then you really tell. There's no hiding, right? When, when I am stressed out, there is no hiding. I am not like, you know, sweet. You're going to really see who I am when I am under stress. In the, this first temptation, this was Jesus' test. Let's put you under stress and let's see how you do. And his response was obedience, His response was to trust his father. 
John Wesley, the, um, the founder of the Methodist movement, he grew up in a, in a church going, going to worship as a kid. And there was a prayer that he grew up with. And so as he became the founder of the Methodist movement, he took that prayer from his childhood, he adapted it, and it has become known as the Wesley Covenant Prayer. And Methodists all over the world will often say it um, together, recite it at the beginning of a new year. But in John Wesley's day, they would often gather when they gathered for, for small groups, they would say it. So I really want us to, to read it together because this is the prayer. This is the we're, like test, right? This is the test for us as followers of Jesus. Can we really mean this when we say it? So will you say it with me? I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me put work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I made in, on earth let it also be made in heaven. Wow. If we really mean that, that means we're willing to put ourselves in the wilderness and we promise with God's help to obey and to trust him. There's a, a passage in, in Psalm 119.11 that I love. And it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you're going to mean that prayer that we just said, then you better have God's word either at your fingertips or in your heart or both. Because when the testing comes, we have to do like Jesus did and we have to go to God's word. And I will tell you, there is no better place to be when things are stripped away, when life gets uncomfortable, than to be in the word of God. Because in our desperation, we can also find gratitude. Um, eight days ago, I returned home from a mission trip to Honduras. I, I get to take a team of all women. I love it um, every year. And, and we just got back, and it's amazing. Um, to kind of give you some context, we partner with World Gospel Outreach in Honduras. Um, and we, uh, we partner with them to take medical care out to villages, very, very poor villages. Um, we also take the gospel out and to even travel to these little towns I mean you go from like riding in a yellow school bus I love it uh, through these paved two-lane roads and you keep going and going and going until you find yourself on this single dusty rocky path and you just keep going and going and then um like when we arrived at the church, which by the way, this church that we went to, the Quest Men built this church. So that was very cool. We have a relationship with the pastor there. But when we arrived there, we saw a line of people gathered outside the, the church home. And um, look, there were a lot of women. They were carrying babies. There were people who had umbrellas to... Uh, kind of guard against the, the sun. But here's what I noticed. They didn't have chairs to sit down in if they got tired or uh, their back started hurting while waiting. They didn't have snacks with them if the line took a while. Um, and they didn't have a phone or little game to keep themselves occupied, right? They just were standing there. 
But what they did have is they had need, and they had illnesses, and they had pain, and they had hunger. And one of one morning, I think it was the I think it was the first day. Um, we actually got a sense of just how desperate their hunger was. Um, Because let's just be honest, I mean, we're North American teams, and we kind of have our comfort food, right? So we're, we're there, we work all morning, but then they close the clinic so that we can, oh, get off our feet because we might have been standing for a couple of hours. And we have a cooler with lunch. It's in the very, very simple, simple sandwich, a simple little bag of chips, but it's something. And so we were sitting there and kind of like telling stories and sharing what we had experienced. Um, and so one of the ladies said that she had like some extra sandwich left over. And so, you know, could she give it to, to one of the, the dogs that had been wandering in and out of, out of the church? And there was one particular dog, clearly she had just had puppies and she looked a little tired. Um, but we wanted to do things the right way. So um, she went to the WGO leader and asked, would it be okay? And sweet Gunther, he, he looked at her with the greatest compassion, this gentle, gentle spirit, and was like, you know, um, yeah, you can, you can, um, but uh, be just careful that no one sees you. Do that because the people that are outside the church, um, they haven't eaten anything today. And many of them will go home and not eat today. So they might not understand why you're feeding the dog. And she was like, oh. I mean, we thought we understood the hunger. But really it was desperation that we were in the middle of. And the next day, um, we had an opportunity to go help a woman named Maria. Now, to get to Maria's home, um, we had to go down. Look, no joke. It was, I felt like I needed to be part mountain goat. Um, It was so rocky and so steep. I was either going to fall forward and take out half of the team that was going with me, or I was just going to be stuck. Um, But we we made it down into a little home that was made of uh, corrugated metal and weathered wood, and we met Maria, who was about 60 or 70 years old, uh, and we were assembling a water filter system because a lot of the illnesses come from contaminated water. Y'all humbled, humbled, because the path that I barely made down one time, I'm like, Maria, as a like a 60 or 70 year old woman, oh, by the way, who only has one arm, travels that carrying water carrying food up and down in order to live. That's her life every day. But here's what humbled me. Because if that had been me, I would have been curled up in a corner going, woe is me, I don't have anything. No, she had just this sweet little smile. And she was saying, thank you, God. Thank you for the angels that you have brought. She was so grateful because she didn't look at what she was missing. She looked at what she had been given. She didn't dwell on what she didn't have. She was delighting in who God is. Her desperation drove her to be thankful, not to be bitter. May we be like that. Amen. We're going to continue to worship um, one more time. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand up as we pray. And look, I don't know if, if you are at a place in your life where you just kind of feel desperate. You feel like things have been stripped away. You are uncomfortable. You need prayer. Calm down. Let's pray for you. But maybe things are pretty good. And maybe your response today is just gratitude. It's just 
thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are, that you suffered for me, and that you are my Savior. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just give you our full selves, knowing that we have nothing to give you, nothing to give you but our praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen.